Well, I look forward to uh, interacting with you with some questions. And uh, I did a somewhat similar talk to this to most, uh, about three or four years ago. And in, in my, this is my fourth term as president of the California State Board of Education. And the first and fourth terms are separated by 40 years. So uh, the correlation as I was Jerry Brown's education advisor in 1974, and he and I are still going strong uh, in 216. And we have until uh, 219 to finish our job here. So uh, you know, as you'll see from my talk, it's still very much in transit uh, at this point. Uh, what I saw in the last version of this, um, which is actually pretty interesting to review, was my thought that uh, there's so much policy change and it is doing so much to the data systems in terms of blowing up the old ones uh, and creating new ones with entirely new concepts of data and metrics and indicators and accountability. Uh, that it was a good uh, time for me to come and talk with uh, students and scholars uh, about what these uh, federal and state policies that are new are uh, doing to uh, research and data systems. Uh, I don't have uh, uh, a complete answer. It's uh, very much in flux. I'll give you some strong hints, show you the future, uh, and then uh, we can talk about some of the implications of this. Uh, as you know, the federal government uh, passed the elementary, the Every Student Succeeds Act. ESSA, forget NCLB, it's ESSA. Uh, that was quite a surprise to a number of people, including me, and uh, uh, it, it is important that they endorsed many of the concepts that California was moving on. California made big changes through its local control funding uh, uh, legislation in, in 2013. Uh, but they are, we're both coming together with new indicators and new accountability systems but uh, it'll, it may be until 2021 that schools experience any real consequences from these accountability systems. So we're in very much of a, a flux. And then you have to build up for accountability. You just don't land on them after the first year. You need to uh, have some trend lines, obviously. So until we get these in place, as you'll see from the uh, description I'm about ready to uh, give you, and then until we actually apply them, uh, it will be a number of years. So you're, as students, uh, in an era of intense change, flux, and uh, it'll be a little bit of a moving target for, for you uh, to deal with. So uh, let me explicate that a bit. Uh, the basic structure of, uh, of the ESCA, it, uh, it, it, uh, in many ways it was talked about how big the state control became, and that's true, and you'll see that. And overall, I'm pretty happy with this law as against NCLB, which in its latter years was out of date. In its earlier years, it was uh, more of a much more of a mixed bag. Uh, but it looks a lot like uh, no child left behind in some ways. So it's sort of half no child left behind and half new stuff uh, with state flexibility and new concepts. So as you can see there, um, it has uh, all of these characteristics that we've known over the past years in terms of federal aid. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 at the very end in the political uh, battles, uh, the uh, groups that wanted to preserve a lot of the older NCLB uh, became more successful. Uh, this law passed overwhelmingly by, I remember the Senate vote was roughly 80 to 20, uh, so it was bipartisan and uh, really a piece of, uh, of crafting uh, work by, by the legislature. They really shocked me that they could even do this. So uh, states are now in the, more in the driver's seat. I wouldn't say not in it, we're more in the driver's seat. Uh, we have much more authority to make decisions and uh, particularly uh, to look at uh, uh, things uh, like uh, implementing uh, uh, the goals for assessment uh, and implementing the means of accountability. Uh, the federal government requires us and has a, you'll see a lot of metrics in here to use certain metrics of, to measure school, school districts and schools. But we at the state level figure out what the, uh, uh, what the uh, follow-up action is if you're not doing well or if you are doing well. In the past, NCLB had this all prescribed and you, you know, had to uh, take certain steps. 
uh, lim eliminated and uh, not, uh, I'm not mourning about these, is annual yearly progress. As you know, the federal law under NCLB was you didn't get anything for growth. It was the number of students who got over a particular hurdle, which was called proficiency. So students just below the hurdle, you know, didn't help anybody in terms of uh, accountability or uh, those sort of things. So now it's much more of a uh, growth-oriented area. And uh, one of the things I think you all could work on that I'll talk about in the future is what is a growth metric? How should we measure growth? I'll come back to that. How much growth is good enough? Uh, uh, I, don't, I have very little guidance on this. I could give you a huge research agenda where I'm fishing around for the answers. And, uh, and so uh, uh, we proceed with humility. Uh, so also uh, high quality teachers, that's gone. There is some uh, more uh, 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 area of the differences between school districts and teacher characteristics. But NCLB said you had to measure a high quality teacher and what are called supplemental education services, which was this uh, use of Title I money for private tutoring companies. They were really terrible in the end. I mean, we spent $200, $300 million a year on uh, t tutoring uh, with fly-by-night operators that just sickened me that we gave them money. Uh, there are new limitations on the secretarial authority. There's pages of the law about what the secretary cannot do. The day of, you know, Arne Duncan will be in my, certainly my lifetime, and maybe Tom D's, maybe not yours. Uh, he'll be the high market, uh, market, I think, of the intervention secretary, and they'll have to repeal all these laws. Uh, to get him back in action the way he, the waivers are absolutely forbidden, uh, can't do anything with testing or curriculum. Uh, and uh, we have, as states, we, uh, we used to send him waivers and he just turned them down and sent me a letter. Uh, and now we can appeal them. He has to have stronger grounds. So uh, we're in a much uh, more um, uh, uh, stronger position as uh, state officials in the, than in the past. Uh, Okay, so uh, it is uh, important here that uh, we must adapt, uh, adopt challenging academic standards, but the secretary may not require them for approval. Ca California, I'll really talk about California because I, that's, I know the federal and I know California. You ask me about other states, uh, I, get, I don't know much. So, uh, but it is important when you look at these aligned assessments, and we'll come back to this, uh, that, uh, that those are preserved. California has adopted the Common Core Standards. We're all in on it. We're uh, regarded as one of the nation's leaders in Common Core. Uh, I generally look at what New York State does with Common Core and I do the opposite. I mean, there, you know, if, as long as you're not doing what New York is doing, you're going to be okay was one of the ways yeah, I, I, I figured out how to proceed. So we have not had any blowback from Common Core. We've had minimal opt-outs. Uh, one of the major opt-outs we had was Palo Alto High School, a couple other very high income districts. Our opt-outs were all from districts where the average home is over a million dollars and they were minuscule. Uh, so we're common core, so we have no problem with that. Uh, our assessment is smarter balanced. It, uh, one of the great things Duncan did uh, was he spent um, uh, 320 million dollars on new assessments. Uh, one's called Smarter Balance that we use, and another's called Park. And so, for he, uh, we got an assessment funded at 165 million dollars by the federal government. More on that later. Uh, but I'm happy to use it. I think it's the best assessment out there, called Smarter Balanced, and I'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, so uh, our assessment, the peer review, the federal government reviews your state assessments, uh, and. Um, the uh, must occur in grades through through eight and, and, and high school, one grade in high school, usually the 11th grade with a college readiness um, indicator on it. Um, the Smarter Balanced Assessment has four levels. Level three is college and career ready. Uh, and so we do compute that. 
And college and career ready means in California that the California, if you scored a certain point on the Smarter Balanced 11th grade test, the California State University and the California Community Colleges will, will, uh, uh, will not require you to take remediation. So I could give you another talk on, on how well we've aligned with, with uh, higher ed. That's been a major focus in California, not so much in other states. Uh, alternate assessments are for handicapped children. Uh, and the uh, minimum participation requirement. New York's really sweating it over that, um, and, and, uh, but not California. Okay, uh, we'll talk a lot about uh, this, but it's very important that the federal government has legislated for multiple measures. Uh, states like California that we're talking about multiple measures beyond test scores, we're getting a lot of blowback, uh, and now it's the law of the land. Uh, and so there are uh, several of these, and I will give you examples of what we're considering and examples of what some school districts uh, are using here uh, in that regard. So uh, if uh, it'll be more difficult for researchers just to grab test scores and say, that's the sole indicator of outcomes, and that's what we're going to run all our regressions on. We're going to push against that and, um, more later uh, on that. Uh, there are, as I say, the old NCLB still lives in some ways in that there are uh, levels of, inter in, uh, these are the fe in the federal law, uh, intervention and targeted uh, uh, ways. And look at this first one. Uh, there are something like 10 to 13 subgroups, low income, racial ethnicity, um, handicapped children, English learners, and so on. Uh, and the federal law says you must do something for each subgroup that would be uh, identified as in the lowest performing 5% of schools. Uh, and the, so uh, one of our arguments with the federal government is this law is directed, the federal law is directed at schools. California's view is that schools are embedded in school systems. And often schools fail because the systems fail. They have a bad human relations department. So uh, we'll be going through the motions on their school stuff, but we're really looking at school districts as well. And as you see there, you must develop an improvement plan. Uh, and then there's these, the state must step in after a number of years. Usually that's four years. So to get this system up and running, four years, that's where I get my 2021. I'll be long gone from Sacramento by the time anything really happens uh, with this re regard. Now, what does the state do when it steps in? That's up to the state. Uh, we all, uh, the timing of this is that 216, 217 school year is a transition year. And then 217, 218 is the first year of operation. So the clock doesn't even start on any of this till 218 uh, spring. That's the end of the year. Uh, and uh, we have to write a state plan uh, on all of these uh, 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 factors that I'm describing to you today during uh, this year. And we, we intend to uh, uh, wait for Obama to leave. We've not had good relations with them and submit it in January uh, of 2017 and take our chances with the next administration. Okay, so then there uh, in the federal law, are, this is something right out of uh, Duncan's waiver policy. You must uh, identify for comprehensive in intervention uh, the lowest 5% uh, or the high schools with the graduation rates of less than two-thirds. There's always going to be a bottom 5%. So, it, you know, I, we were never thrilled with the idea that there's an arbitrary 5%. Uh, and uh, also the schools from the first part of it that uh, in any, in which any subgroup uh, for, uh, is low for a number of years, which appears to be four. Uh, and then there'll be plenty of, uh, of interventions. They'll be all different from state to state. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the states on their assessments. They're all over the place. Uh, you know, they're, 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 some are, 22 are using Smarter Balanced and Park, but they, a number of those aren't for high school, and that means the majority of states are using some other assessment other than the federal ones that are developed. So there'll be a lot to study here on intervention, uh, but it'll be a long time and uh, uh, till I think anything that is really uh, very draconian takes place. Okay, uh, California. Uh, California in 2013 uh, passed a, a new law which included a new way of funding schools. It is one of the most radically equalized systems I know of. 
uh, low-income pupils, English learner pupils who aren't low-income, and foster care children all get very high weights in this. If you, our innovation is if you have a concentration in your school district of over 55% of low-income or EL pupils, then you get approximately 50% more money for every pupil over that 55% threshold. So we have been, and we have uh, uh, put $54 billion into the system since you left uh, uh, Sacramento in 2012. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, we've really, our economy's roaring ahead, our revenues are looking good, and so on. So we've done a lot of funding. Uh, and so uh, uh, pregnant of uh, area for study is what happens when all this money goes out uh, with, a lot, with, with much less uh, of state control. What do they do with the money? Uh, so um, that, that in effect, when we did that, we also passed an accountability law, a state accountability law. Our assumption was that no child left behind would never, you know, would be there for the foreseeable future. Uh, that uh, certainly wouldn't have passed uh, this year, uh, and uh, uh, in 215 rather, and uh, and so we set up our own system with eight state priorities. Talk a little bit more about that. Our old test is gone, the California Standards Test, and the new ESSA with it will be part of our multiple measurement system. That'll include federal indicators and integrated system. Before we had AYP over here and our system over here. Now we're integrating them. So we're gonna have federal indicators in ESSA, more state indicators, you'll see them soon, uh, under our local control funding law, and then locally nominated indicators that they wanna use uh, for showing how well they're doing and for any kinds of accountability purposes. Uh, and so the, the new local finance system creates a, a district local accountability plan on how to use their resources and there are eight state priority outcomes and, and I'll give you some hints of those as, as we go forward. Okay, let me talk, we need to talk about testing here a little bit. Um, so sm California uses smarter balanced test. The old test was a, called the California Standards Test. It was a mo all moldable choice, straight format, uh, moldable choice, uh, and uh, and and uh, at, at, and it had it, very low ceiling, meaning you it it did not spread the distributions very highly uh, at the high end. Uh, so uh, it, in the new smarter balanced assessment, first of all, it is adaptive. That means if you're answering hard questions, you get more hard questions. If you're answering easy, uh, struggling with e uh, easy questions, we give you easier questions. So every student is taking his or her own test. Uh, and so at the high end, it goes way up. And what we're seeing is predictable. Our achievement gap is growing. All of a sudden, we took the ceiling off the old lower level test and, you know, they're blowing the top off. And, and uh, some of our lower achievers have dropped because this assessment's harder. Harder in two ways. It's geared to the Common Core standards, which are college-ready uh, standards. In other words, you can go to college without being in remediation, community college or uh, uh, four-year college. Moreover, it has this extended response where you have to justify an answer, uh, respond to some queries. So it's not so, and it's all kids are all taking it on computer, and the districts are. Uh, of course, it's computer adaptive, and the districts start with keyboarding now in kindergarten because by third grade they're in the extended response answers. Uh, and finally, we have the creme de la creme of testing called the performance exam. Uh, this was designed, uh, some of them, or by a woman here on the second floor named Linda Darling Hammond uh, of this building. And that's where you take a problem if you're in high school, like nuclear power, uh, you get a lot of different sources, you read them, and you come up with your own analysis of the strengths and weaknesses of the nuclear power. These take about an hour and a half. Uh, and this is not your grandfather's test. Uh, and so, uh, it's an all new one, so if you're a researcher, uh, we're, we really are discouraging people from trying to build longitudinal data from our old test to our new test. They're, as we view it, very different, and, uh, and um, I'm sure researchers will try and shoehorn them in somehow and uh, build longitudinal studies, but you know, to us it doesn't uh, uh, fit very well with what we're uh, trying to do. 
So as I indicated, um, the other states are, you know, 22 of them have some model like this. Uh, but the other new thing which is just breaking across the country is that the, um, uh, the author, prime author, a prime author, there are only a few of them, of the Common Core English Language Arts Standards was a man named David Coleman. And uh, he then became appointed as the head of the college board which runs the SAT. And so he has junked the old SAT and the new one is coming in in March. And this is nothing like any SAT anybody in this room took. Uh, and so it also has you defending your answer, but it's a paper and pencil test. To me, it's an old-fashioned test. Why would you use paper and pencil? In a, so he's re, uh, a paper and pencil test, and it doesn't have extended response. They do have a writing thing as a performance exam, but nothing like the an analytical one we have. So in my uh, layman's test uh, evaluation, I rate smarter balanced over SAT, although I'm delighted with SAT. It's aligned to the common core. Uh, it's, it's much more uh, uh, challenging in some ways, uh, and it is much different than the past. ACT, on the other hand, has been uh, not changing it mu their tests much, and so uh, I'm hoping they will align to the Common Core, um, but SAT has come roaring out of the box with a new SAT, and uh, uh, it, it is very different. They've dropped all the, uh, you know, uh, obscure words that I've never saw before since I took it in 1957, and, you know, and, and so, and, and really retooled the thing uh, in a way that uh, I think will be in, in that regard. Uh, now, the University of California, all four systems of higher education in California have endorsed Common Core and are uh, looking, and, and two of the systems will use the, uh, uh, the Smarter Balanced Assessment. Uh, in California, the University of California approves the high school c courses. Uh, you submit it to the, board, uh, the uh, office of the, the UC Office of the President K-12 Department, and so they're uh, uh, they're looking at uh, how these courses will match up with Common Core. So we have higher ed and lower ed with the SAT, uh, the acceptance for uh, for uh, non-remediation the A to G core, we have quite a bit of synergy with higher ed. In all my past career, we've had K-12 making policies over here on accountability assessment metrics and, and higher ed over here, and we never talked to each other and so on. And now we also had, of course, to junk our new high school exit exam because it was all based on older standards. Uh, so that's gone, and we're trying to figure out uh, if we should bring back a new one, and if we should, could we... Uh, use smarter balance for it where if you're getting easy questions we give you easier ones on the adaptive test and at some point we'd say that's too low for graduation. That's a long discussion and, uh, and, and just beginning. Uh, yeah, I'll take them at any time. Yeah, that's, that'd be good. I don't know anybody using SAT yet as a as a graduation test. What they as the account test? Yes, there are uh, uh, 21 states. 21 states now require students to take the SAT or the ACT. That's require it, uh, and uh, a number of states are are uh, using it for accountability. Uh, what is the number here? Twelve states now use SAT or the ACT as their officially federally mandated accountability reports. So there are twelve states and more coming uh, in, in this regard. Uh, so definitely this is an issue and we're caught double testing. You know, we're, we're giving them a smarter balance. They take the SAT. That's why Palo Alto walked out. Uh, and, um, and so this is an issue to look at. Uh, in, in the future. And I have a PowerPoint comparison. I held a conference uh, comparing SAT and, and, um, and the Smarter Balanced Assessment. And it's very, very interesting. 
They're pretty close. I pointed out some differences. SAT gives much more data back to the students now <clears throat> on what you can do to improve. They have an arrangement with Khan Academy uh, where you, know, you as a student can go in and work on your problems. They give feedback to schools, SAT does, on how your school's doing. And, and SAT is expanding into the middle grades of 7, 8, and 9. <clears throat> so where all this is going, I don't know. They're, we're talking and um, trying to work this out. Uh, over time, but it's clearly uh, all it's, it signals a new era of higher ed, lower ed alignment uh, uh, that's out there in, in that regard. Yeah. Yeah, they, right, a lot of them took low bidder and got stuck with fly by night delivers. Uh, sometimes a lot of state contracts say you got to take the low bidder, and they just, they ended up with people. These are we tested 3.4 million pupils all on computer. Three years ago, our school's average school had the average bandwidth of a family, so we spent millions of dollars uh, wiring schools, bringing them up. The final thing I was worried about was Death Valley, which is below sea level. It's really hard to get wireless into Death Valley. Uh, and we pulled it off without, with no major flaws whatsoever. So um, I think that's, um, but we did not take the low bid. Uh, and so there's various contractors, and sometimes in life you get what you pay for. And this seemed to me to be an example of it. So. I don't know where those states are going to go with that. They are changing, and so a lot of the systems crash. So if you're trying to work in, in uh, there's about five or six states that just threw up their hands, maybe more. Uh, the systems just crashed. Yeah, there was one day we tested 500,000 students. You know, it's just, you know, you could, that we could do all this is, is really an unsung here, all on computer, all with a very fancy, you know, high-end, state-of-the-art test with performance exam on it and, and everything else. I mean, we were sweating bullets worrying about how we're going to do this. And we're past that hurdle, I think. Once you do it right once, I'm, I think it'll be okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Were you in the pilot test or the final test? The, the one for real or the pilot? The pilot. Yeah, the pilot was a pilot. <laughs> uh, and, but, you know, the, the, irregardless of that, your question applies equally well to the final test, in my view. And, yes, there are a number of states. I don't have anything about California, but a number of states um, where they had. Okay, there was a number of states where they couldn't get ready. So we had an option of a paper and pencil. We had 917 students out of 3.6 million use a paper and pencil. So, but a lot of states had like a natural experiment, you know, where they had paper and pencil and, and uh, they had these computer-based tests and they did find it, it just isn't, uh, wasn't just strictly income, it was other factors, but, uh, uh, you know, with the rural districts and so on. Um, so there has been a difference. So, uh, and that's why the mottos of California state po policy, patience, persistence, humility. Uh, patient. We're not going to rush to judgment. Uh, we're, I'm, one of my uh, unstated hopes is that the kids will get better with, and more facile with the computers, and that will drive our test scores up. And, that, and you'll get a, we'll, we'll be able to show growth and proclaim victory. Uh, and it's really a computer art, artifact uh, rather than, uh, oh, the teaching's so much better. But those trying to use these tests for research, I'm very glad you asked that. Beware, that's, a, that's an issue. And, uh, and so as long as the accountability is fairly far out there, then you're going to have the patience. Uh, and, and so, and humility is, you don't know what, with lots of these reforms, you don't know what's going to happen. So, uh, so you proceed with humility. Other questions at this point? Yeah.
Yeah. Okay, so we sat down and negotiated with the uh, UC, University of California. Uh, they're in like Never Never Land. I mean, you know, they're in some other orbit. And uh, the policies are run by the Board of Admissions and Secondary Schools, BORS, B-O-A-R-S. And I've had lunch at the faculty club with those gentlemen and, that, and ladies and you know, that's a hard push. So we negotiated uh, with the California State University system. Uh, I think there are, you know, uh, uh, trying to remember how many campuses, and, and then the, uh, the community colleges. So, uh, and they, they, we, they worked with us on designing the test all the way. They were in the room with us on Smarter Balanced. And they then were involved in it. They were on the boards that uh, directed the development of it. And so they said, uh, you know, now that we've seen this assessment, and then you do a, a, a process where you set what is the performance level for college and career ready. Uh, and uh, they, they then said if that the level you've set college and career ready, we will t take those students that score at a certain point without remediation in 11th grade or we will take other students in the 12th grade who have completed a mathematics test, uh, the, uh, uh, sorry, another mathematics course, not test, mathematics course in 12th grade. And CSU is designing an all new 12th grade mathematics course. The senior year I, is, you know, uh, largely, it, for a lot of students, is a, not an optimal year. It's, uh, so we're really beginning to repurpose the senior year around this college readiness orientation. There's already a course out there done by, designed by CSU called the Early Reading and Writing Course. And I'm giving a lecture tomorrow to the Humanities Department and it appears like they're going to give me a hard time. But, because one of the things that happened in uh, Common Core uh, was that we put in a lot more nonfiction. And that came from the colleges. They said, you know, these kids may be fine in Beowulf, but when I give them a, you know, a, a complex piece of, of technical reading, they can't do it and they, they, have, com they have trouble with nonfiction. and a lot of our work in college is nonfiction. So we also, the Common Core standards respond to this as well uh, in, that, uh, in that area. So they've been on board and uh, we have formal agreements with them uh, at this point. Another thing with SAT is they don't have accommodations for handicapped children, English learner children. They never had to worry about that. So I don't know what these states are going to do that are uh, using them uh, for that situation. I mean, if, if I didn't have accommodations for handicapped children, they'd, you know, take me to jail. Yeah. Uh, do you know how water balance scores the performance of some of the top questions? I'm wondering about the potential scope for implicit biases and it's a mixture of computer and people. Uh, a lot of it can be uh, done on uh, by computer, uh, but they also, for both, use people. Uh, and uh, the good news about that is that they hire our teachers to score them, pay them, uh, and then they learn a lot more about the assessment. So it is actually a very interesting form of paid professional development. So in our contract with the, our contractor is ETS, and you know that was really featured. So uh, and uh, Linda's uh, worked out a lot of protocols for how to use uh, scoring, and they're paid uh, for learning about reteaching and the assessment. So it's so Smarter Balanced uh, is an instructional system. Uh, the, when you get the results, it's broken down by targets at the level of, say, fractions or something. And then each teacher has an account into a digital library, which is part of the Smarter Balance system. So they look at the target that the kids are having trouble with, and then they go in and they can look in the digital library for uh, things that you know, will help them to reteach it. Uh, so we are... Uh, California is all in. It's not an assessment. It's not just a test. It is an instructional assessment. It's loaded uh, instructional improvement system. Uh, and it is loaded with short cycle tests. So they give lots of the teachers give lots of short cycle tests and not just summative system tests. 
So the whole thing is you're buying a new instructional system with professional development in it, uh, and uh, we've, uh, uh, in, 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 that, in that regard. So it's really quite, uh, uh, it's so different. I, you know, in my other presentations, I have questions from the old uh, um, assessment, the uh, California standards test compared to smart or balanced, and it's like night and day in terms of, of the nature of these assessments. So uh, comparing them is going to be hard. Uh, it seems to me, and, uh, and building trend lines, and then what is the growth? You've got this, this uh, technology factor in there. You know, I have not a clue on the growth, growth metric. Okay, we're going to get smarter ballot. We're, we're giving the assessment soon. I'm going to get scores quick. And uh, they, now that it's computerized, and we, had, we took too long the first year, it was a problem. Uh, but those scores will be coming back to the districts in the middle of June, uh, the end of June and early July. So I look at them, let's hope for growth. Okay, pray for growth. So I get some growth. Is it, how good is it? I don't know. How would I know how good it is? Uh, I don't really know uh, at this point. Uh, I can say there's a trend. Uh, but these value-added models of teaching, uh, I, you know, I don't see how they can continue with a value-added model with such a shifting test with teachers getting used to an entirely new system. So we were never thrilled about value added VAM in California because I knew it was coming in at a time of transition and uh, we fought tooth and nail against Arne Duncan. He won some, I won a few and um, you know we're where we are now. We have, we have the overwhelming support for Common Core and Smarter Balanced of our teacher core. Our, our ratings in, f in favor of it are in the, in the mid to high 70s and so we deliberately played a game of trying to bring along our educators rather than declaring war on them. Um, so, but that's, you know, beyond the, that's an extended riff on your question. I was wondering about something much more practical. Yeah. Since California doesn't want to be like New York, uh, up until recently in New York, teachers' graded uh, assessments were based on the recency pattern. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, and so that the teachers were able to see pretty effective manipulation of the scores by students who were just below thresholds that had no, they're not. No, they're not grading their own their students. I don't really know a lot about New, New York. But they also have their own test based on Common Core. And I don't understand how that relates exactly to Regents, frankly. And that's the one that's got them in trouble. They had to, you know, they, I don't know what, what all is going on there but, um, in that regard. Okay, so, um, so no, uh, this is the point I was going to make on teacher evaluation. No assessment trend line during the Common Core transition, at least here, and I think in many other states. Um, uh, and then we cut some tests. Grade two, uh, Smarter Balance started at three. There was a lot of controversy about whether testing in grade two is a good idea. Uh, we cut nine and ten uh, and just have eleven. That was, as you saw, the federal law. We were treated to the federal minimum. Um, now, another area here we're discussing is using the PSAT in grade 10. Uh, and that would, that, since they're aligned to Common Core, that is on, under discussion. Uh, we cut uh, uh, social studies exams and as you know, we're redoing our science uh, assessments uh, and we're bringing, uh, we're uh, continuing with an, with an old uh, science assessment which is not aligned to our standards. Uh, so I've already made the point that the state assessments are so varied that NAEP is going to be important However, I remain concerned about NAEP because one of the things that Smarter Balance did, that the Common Core did, was resequence the mathematics. And meaning you don't teach it in the grades that, uh, that you did before. And in, in some analyses we've looked at and AIR has looked at, NAEP is, is tested, test fourth graders. Uh, 
I think, uh, uh, and, and so fourth graders. So we're actually teaching things in different order than the NAEP test. So we're, we expect to get, you know, beat up by NAEP and because we, they, our kids either ha haven't had it yet or have had it. And uh, 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 so it's, uh, I think that we're going to, uh, there will be quite a dispute, I think, coming on about uh, whether NAEP w doesn't need, the, la the NAEP frameworks and mathematics were revised, were based on 204, and this is 216, and so we would like NAEP to get up into the, the you know, later part, uh, later years. So that, so it'll be important. There's already one report out proclaiming that Common Core is topped out from Brookings Institute, uh, you know, Common Core topped out based on NAEP scores. We haven't even implemented it. It's, it, you know, it's crazy, but that's, that's the kind of stuff that goes on. Okay, California, uh, the, uh, I've talked a little bit about this. Uh, I'm not going to uh, get into that. The second issue there is a, uh, is a very tricky issue. You know, we have weights. Should the weighted pupil money be traced in great detail down to the pupils that, quote, earned it? Uh, that's still being worked on. Uh, a lot of qualitative data will be useful. Rather than, uh, you know, what I need is, is not so much stuff that's in quantitative databases, but what the hell is going on out there? Uh, you know, we're changing all kinds of things. Next generation science standards, uh, you know, and uh, we've got, you know, and we have these concerns about the depth of professional development, uh, the effective teaching strategies, uh, the new math, of course, in Common Core, uh, in the middle grades includes algebra, geometry, and statistics. Uh, used to be you had to wait for statistics till you got to college, so now it's taught uh, early. And so it's very different. Uh, you have mathematics teachers who are being asked to teach in different uh, ways and different content. Uh, and I'd like some longitudinal implementation studies that follow this for a number of years, asking similar questions. I once did in my early career 16-year longitudinal study of the implementation of Title I. It was just what was going on on the ground, not what the outcomes were, but what was the actual implementation. Uh, and I think those would be important. I know that has been less stressed in research in recent ways, but, uh, you know, we're trying to make mid, uh, early corrections, mid-course corrections, anything like that would be helpful. Uh, I'm not going to get into our concerns about the, uh, uh, we have, we're currently um, the federal government's uh, doing uh, the regulations. Uh, so there's a big argument about how far they can go with f beyond the law with their regulations. The biggest argument that uh, we and I'll come back to the biggest argument, which is you need a single number. Okay, uh, now moving into a blizzard of indicators, and uh, stop me at any point here, because we're, uh, so this is, of course, the new social-emotional skills. Uh, this burst on the scene in the last, uh, uh, for policy makers like me, I'd say it's the last four years uh, that it's become across my radar screen. It's, of course, been in the literature for a long time. Uh, these are the so-called grit factors. Uh, these are gaining in uh, uh, interest, uh, and people are really trying to figure out uh, what we can do about measuring these. Uh, and um, so there's a whole a lot of research about the um, ability to measure them. Even harder, I think, it may be possible to measure that Tom has more grit than I do, but how are we changing year to year in our grit factors? I, you know, I, that, that strikes me as very difficult to, 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 uh, uh, to do, but uh, people are incorporating this, and I'll show you one system. Uh, there are correlation studies. I don't know how really good they are, but they look interesting that show these predict uh, pupil uh, outcomes on assessments in high school graduation and college and so on. They're showing some interesting results. I haven't seen searching reviews of this. Okay, now on to a, grand, a couple of grand indicator systems. Uh, this is the core districts. You, these are districts, 10 of them, that got a waiver from the federal government, local districts. 
They encompass over a million students in California. Uh, they have their own uh, a set, a system that they use uh, because they had a federal waiver and they had to submit this to the federal government. So there's two parts of this, and uh, that's the second part, and here's the first part. I'll just flash those. Okay, first argument with, that one has is, can you take all of what I'm going to cover here and sum it into a single number? Notice this, this school gets an 88. So our view so far at the California State Board is, how do we summarize a whole bunch of moldable indicators into a single number? Tell me the scientific basis for how much weight each of these should get. And, I'll, and then, then you can then tell me how I can smush them together, the apples, oranges, and bananas, throw them into a smoothie, and get some kind of number, a single number. It appears that the, uh, you know, the various interest groups and uh, Duncan wanted single numbers, so he wanted 88. Uh, and the whole damn shooting match was a number. So California is going to be fighting on this, and um, we have a lot stronger uh, 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 basis uh, in the new ESSA law than we did in NCLB. Okay, so performance. Uh, this will be the smarter balance test. Uh, the second one, as you see, this school, you can see it okay, yeah, uh, district average, state average. Comparing everything to the, the state average and the district average is, I think, a really good idea, particularly to the state averages. Um, the growth, how do we do growth? Chronic absenteeism. Uh, the indicator shows that we have good figures on average daily attendance, but some studies have shown that low attendance can be driven by a small number of pupils who are chronically absent. That's your real problem, those kids, not the overall rate of attendance in the LA Unified School District. Uh, so that this one will, the law, ESSA, requires states to uh, to uh, collect this. We do not currently collect it. We will collect it by uh, 217, but that's there. Culture climate surveys. These are school climate surveys uh, that these people have drawn up. The state has one that is attached to a, uh, a primarily a health survey. Uh, as you can see, they're moving in different uh, directions. Now, this is a mock-up because they don't have state averages, so they just report this school and district averages. Then they go on to suspension and expulsion. Uh, social emotional skills, I talked about that one. Uh, and you notice they rank that. Uh, EL redesignation rate. This is when you've been an English learner, been given, whoops, an assessment in your, uh, and, and your um, England, English learner program, and then you, when do you exit? And the states are required under ESSA to have one state definition of when you were redesignated from English learner to non-English learner. California has no such statewide indicator. The local schools are all over the place uh, on what they use, and so we will be required by federal law uh, to have a single rate. And uh, finally, um, uh, this would be, you know, some kind of, uh, of, uh, of, of visit of, uh, by the state or uh, the crediting account uh, system uh, that would look at these indicators and visit them and declaim them some kind of a winner. So you'll see at the top, uh, you'll get trends. You have the 88 summary. Uh, I've talked uh, about that uh, in, in there. Uh, and one, the state average, a little bit of what we're thinking about is, okay, you take all the districts. Let's start with districts in the state. And you put them into four quadrants. And then if you're in the bottom quadrant or bottom 10 or 5 percent and you've been there for three or four years then you're in what we would call a red zone uh, not a football red zone but a red zone of, of concern uh, and uh, and we would uh, that would be the group we would really take a look at uh, so I think uh, but that's just a comparative normative thing to the state norm it's not really a, a judgment on uh, on a on a uh, ordinal scale of some sort. So that's one example. Questions on that? Yes.
one number um, and how, how is that one number representing the much richer result that we're getting from a test like this and you know, will it really affect the more rigorous performance track data mm -hmm. or is that sort of a global t-shirt that it's really going to get boiled down into one number? Right. So so uh, go into your computer and, you know, look up uh, the, the actual uh, form that parents get at home from California. Uh, and you'll see on there, first of all, um, the first thing you'll say will be a test range. There's errors in all tests. Uh, and so rather than just what level you're at in a magic number, it'll give you a test range score. And then it'll say whether you met the standard. The standard is college and career ready. So parents will know in third grade whether their kids are on a college and career ready basis uh, uh, in that, in, you know, if they want to interpret it that way. Uh, and so then in the back, you'll see the second page. You turn it over, and it has a bunch of claims communication, analysis, reasoning, those are all partly built from the extended response and the performance exams. So, uh, the, and then the claims, we just got the targets out. They were supposed to be out in the fall of 2015. Just got the targets last week, which break it down into smaller uh, uh, granular factors. Those won't be reported to parents. Those are more for students, for schools. So uh, at this point, uh, the, it's more in, they're called claims. They're really buckets of, of broader things that are, you know, more analytical and things of that sort that are different than the, than the past reporting uh, that, that is there. So you want to look at those claim scores, uh, and the parents get those. And they're just beginning, I'm sure, to understand this with any regard. Now remember, and, uh, ESSA says, of all of these indicators that the core districts are using, uh, test scores must matter the most, or assessment scores. So, okay, they would be, uh, you can, but you could do a judgmental thing on this. You could look at these, look at each one, look at the state average on each one, and then you could make a judgment. Look, this school's sort of all over the place. Uh, they're, you know, they're in the 50s, they're in the 80s, they're in the 60s. Uh, you know, how would you, you know, we, we're arguing initially that we would like the right without the federal government per closing our option to say we'd like to look at all of this and make a judgment whether you're in the bottom 5%. Now, the U.S. Department may come back and say, well, a, you know, 88 means you're not in the bottom 5% and that's all we need to know. Uh, and so you'll see an argument about that. Uh, if they indeed come there, I don't know. But the, the, the new Secretary of Education, John King, his prior job was Chief State School Officer of New York State. Not exactly a poster child for how to, in my view, on how to implement these things. So his reward for his problems in New York was to be made U.S. Secretary. So uh, we are maybe again at the ramparts of battle here with the feds. I don't know. Yeah. They sum that all up to a school number. Okay, so they sum up ELA and math. Yeah, they're building some kind of old, what used to be called the academic performance index. So they're summing that thing into one number. Now, your point, I think, is you could break that down and do a much more sophisticated look. And, and I think this is more for illustration from, uh, from that standpoint. It has the potential. And, and our thing will not be to take all this rich data from Smarter Balance, even on the assessment side, and smush it into a number. But that's going to read a lot of flack. See, the counter argument, and it's a good one, is that this, you're giving them too much information. Parents can't understand this. Uh, and so we're, you know, so the federal government has five indicators. And so, uh, you know, so I, there's a real trade-off here. And I'm not at all decided on how to go. That's a really good point. 
you can overwhelm people with sophisticated data and they don't know what the hell's going on. So, uh, and particularly when you're trying to com communicate with parents. So this is a really a struggle and, and that's why this will take some patience. But uh, while we're working all this out, I don't quite know what the researchers do with some of these databases they want to work with, uh, which is part of my point here, uh, that that's regard. So, our, Yeah. And more. They have more. So if you look at, if you want indicators, here's the federally required state accountability system. We probably don't have time for this now. This is on the PowerPoint. I'm sure you can get the PowerPoint. So, ju so there's, a, there's a federal a set uh, uh, here. The federal requires academic achievement. The, just look at the first column, ESSA, or there. Then um, you'll see our possible indicators. This is for the first one of five uh, to be measured by sales scores reflecting both status and sufficient growth over time. So that relates to our prior discussion. The federal law requires a measure for the first time ever of English proficiency. This was never required. Uh, we've never really had a test that could do this well, and we will in 217 have a new assessment. So that's in the second one. Remember, these are federally required. I have no choice in these. Then another academic figure, uh, factor, uh, that's now, that's ESAA in the law. Graduation for high school is in there, but we could also do other things as, uh, as the other academic indicator. Our problem is we have 1,000 school districts, 11,150 schools, 1,150 charter schools. What data do I have in Sacramento for all of those? I've got to have it for all of those. I've got to have it in-house now. Uh, so that limits our options severely. So we will be... Um, adding to these, but right now we have, we know the progress from, we can measure middle school dropouts. Okay, we have that data. So the, uh, the possible California indicators are ones that we have or could pretty easily get. Uh, and then there's some comments on each of those. Those are the federal five. Now I've gone to state. Remember, we haven't talked at all about the local control funding formula law. There's more outcomes in there than there are in the federal. And some of them match the federal and some of them don't. There's eight. So uh, yes, here's the, uh, in addition, college and career readiness indicators. That's in the, in the, uh, in the state law. So we could say, the, you know, you'll see some there, the second column, approved CTE sequence. I'd love to have that, I don't have it. A lot of this we don't have, what you read there is, is a dream list in part uh, in, in terms of, we have almost no data on CTE in terms of uh, related uh, courses where they take a sequence of three courses rather than, uh, and then we also require in student engagement, how to measure that, school resources and, and offerings, uh, that has to be, that's part of the law in California uh, also, um, then there will be local ones, and then we would provide tools to schools and districts to choose and use at their option. Student teacher and parent surveys, that's what, for engagement in school climate, that's what uh, the core districts are using now. They have their own, uh, uh, own uh, surveys, so uh, they're getting data from their schools, they don't, but they are not the whole state. Uh, and then... Uh, Locally selected measure, indi measure indicators. What do locals think would be uh, a fair thing? Uh, you know, they could bring up, we just had an accreditation. They took a look at our school and thought we were really good. And your indicators show we're not so good. Uh, here's the accreditation. In fact, I just had a three-hour meeting uh, last Monday with accreditation saying, you know, maybe we ought to get together. We'll use your stuff, you use our stuff. Right now, they're like higher and lower. They're like two different uh, orbits of, uh, of proceeding. 
and they take an awful lot of time. Um, so that's the end of my formal remarks here, and um, we're ready for a broad set of questions. A little overwhelming, and this is part of what I work on. But uh, so. Uh, may you live in interesting times, the old Chinese proverb, you're all living in those, that's for sure. And this will be more interesting than most. Uh, uh, as Helen knows, we're coming out with a three-dimensional science exam. Uh, and I don't have the ability to project 3D here, so I can't really describe that. But California was the second adopter of the next generation science standards which are a very big change for what we've been doing before in science, uh, which was heavily around memorizing content and so on. So, uh, so we're, we're, and we're, we'll approve a new history social studies framework uh, this May with a very uh, increased emphasis on civics. So uh, there's a lot going on and, um, uh, and, and a lot more to see.